Have you ever had a tough time talking with others or even your close family members about some of your mental health struggles? Well, so have I, and so is my guest today, former pro basketball player Malcolm Lemons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold up. Went into the whole team show up. Welcome back into Iggy Sports Talk. I am your host, Jake Nazuski, or Iggy for short. And I want to thank you so much for tuning into this episode. If this is your first time listening or watching Iggy Sports Talk, in each episode, I focus on telling inspiring stories about athletes, business professionals, and just regular people who struggle with mental health and just, you know, the everyday life experiences and I sort of try and touch on how they've been able to overcome adversity, strive for their dreams, and try and ultimately live each and every single day to the fullest, because that's all what we're really trying to do here, right? And also, my goal is to sort of end the stigma of mental health, uh, not only within sports, but in society, and really be able to help people understand that we're all human beings just trying to figure this thing that we call life out. And we did just that uh, with my guest today. He is a former pro basketball player and a two-time author. His name is Malcolm Lemons. And Malcolm and I, and I essentially talk about the importance of sharing our mental health struggles with others and the impact that therapy has had on both of us, while also explaining why it's so vital to never doubt the process and much, much more. Let's get into my conversation with Malcolm Lemons. I am here with Malcolm Lemons. He's currently building the Hype Report, which is a newsletter covering the latest news and stories at the intersection of sports and Web3. And he's also a former professional basketball player overseas and is also a two-time author for his books, Lessons from the Game and the Impact Beyond the Game. So how are we doing, Malcolm? Fantastic, Jake. Appreciate the opportunity, man. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. And really appreciate you taking the time. And, you know, I, I love the work that you do, uh, really bringing light to some of the mental struggles that you dealt with as an athlete, especially during your time post your career, but also what, what you bring to light just in general, uh, mental health sort of struggles. And, you know, one thing that I think I heard you speak about on, on a previous interview was using the time when we wake up as a building block of what the rest of our day is going to look like. So, you know, using breath exercises, other sort of uh, mental mental health strategies to help us, you know, be grateful for our breath to start off the day. So talk a little bit about what you do in your morning routine to help you be able to start the day off right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be honest with you, it's been a little bit of a struggle as of late. So I've kind of gotten out of a, uh, my, my normal routine, but usually um, you know, in the past, I'll try to get a workout or some type of physical activity in, whether that's just like taking a, a quick walk outside to get some some fresh air or getting like a full on like hour workout, something to kind of get the blood flowing. Um, and, and then also you, you reference like uh, breath work and meditation. That's something that's really has, has been big in my life in the past, um, especially someone who has dealt with uh, anxiety, uh, you know, controlling my breath, being able to kind of uh, you know, take some time to to sit down and, and clear my mind has been very uh, beneficial in terms of just relieving anxiety, relieving any stress or, or anything that might be going through my mind on any given, uh, you know, day. So I think those are probably the two biggest um, uh, parts of my routine that I that I value the most and things that I still try to implement at some part throughout the day, whether it's not in the morning, I always try to get some type of physical activity um, and, and also, uh, just, just sitting down and just thinking through, um, you know, kind of clearing my mind and, and, and really kind of resetting myself is, is something I try to do as well throughout the day, whether that's in the morning or in the afternoon. So I think that's so important, especially, you know, with anxiety, I, I've dealt with it a lot throughout my past. And I, I, I believe that it stems a lot from just not being present and, you know, maybe focusing too much on what's happened in the past and worrying about and trying to control what's going to happen in the future. And that breath work is is so vital. And especially, you know, if I don't know about you, but I would also say positive affirmations to myself while I'm doing some of that breath work. One thing that I've really tried to do recently is if I'm feeling that anxiety or if I'm feeling that tightness in my chest, I close my eyes, take a few deep breaths and I say, all is well, go with the flow. I am safe. I am strong and I'm glad to be here. But I'm curious what, what other ways from, from your experience have you found effective uh, strategies to really relieve your anxiety? Yeah, that that that's the positive affirmations is, is something that I've also tried to implement in the past. So I've, I found that to be very helpful. 
Um, as far as like other methods to relieve my anxiety, I mean, one of the biggest things I think that has been helpful in my life this year was starting therapy. Mm -hmm. um, that within itself, just being able to kind of convey some of my thoughts, some of my feelings to someone else who is a trained profession in the space and could kind of uh, work through some of those the, that pad the past trauma, the past issues that I've experienced in my life has been really beneficial and helpful. Um, and it's something I recommend a lot of people explore, you know, not everybody mm -hmm. might be comfortable taking that step. Um, but I think being open to the, uh, to the option of, you know, getting a therapist and, and working through some of the things that you've, uh, you know, been experiencing, whether that is anxiety or depression or whatever the case may be, I think it's really beneficial and something that, um, has made a, a tremendous impact within the past several months. So, um, there's, you know, not everything is going to work for everybody. So I think for, for a lot of people is, it's, um, you know, kind of doing your due diligence, understanding that there's a lot of different methods to mm -hmm. deal with anxiety and other, um, you know, mental health struggles, but just figuring out through like trial and error, what might work for you, what doesn't work for you. Um, and understanding yourself is, is the most important thing. I think that trial and error and, and being able to have that reflection prior to starting with a therapist is very key as well. And, and with, with looking at um, how you want to have your relationship with your therapist, because it really is, it's a relationship between two people. And, you know, I most recently tried to get back into therapy and I'm going to continue the searching process, but uh, it got to the point where I, I started off the, the session saying, I'm not interested in, in any, you know, med medication to, you know, focus on my mental health. I usually really enjoy the holistic way. And uh, then it got to the point where it was, it was recommended me over and over again. And I had to take a step back and say, all right, this isn't, this isn't the right method. I want to go towards somebody who's a little bit more holistic, but being able to have that awareness within yourself uh, and do the research as well on, on what you're really looking for in a therapist. And I, I think as well, you know, not only as, as an athlete in yourself, but as, as men as well, is being able to open up. And I, I think that's something that, you know, a lot of men really struggle with. And you could even say just people in general and wh whether it's the judgment of others um, and, and them, um, you know, making up in their mind what other people might think. Um, but from, from your experience, and especially Especially being vulnerable about maybe your struggles or or what has been going on with your mental health how have you found the best way to be able to feel comfortable to talk about those things with others yeah it's a great question it's something that i've definitely struggled uh with in the past um being a former athlete growing up in a community where uh you know there it was always like you know tough it out or you know brush it off work through it you were never really allowed or i was never really allowed to, to express myself in vulnerable ways and to be open. And so a lot of the the things I went through in life and the things that I've experienced in my past trauma, I held it in for so long. And I struggled as I got older, articulating my feelings or things that I was going through. And so that kind of manifested itself in anger in a lot of ways, because I didn't know how to, how to convey what I was feeling in any given moment. Um, and it was something I had to become more conscious of as I became older. And frankly, it got to the point where I was just fed up and I was like, I recognize it as it, it, it being unhealthy and that it wasn't conducive to the type of person, the type of man that I wanted to become. And it was affecting my relationships. And so that was the biggest thing for me is seeing how my actions and the way that I wasn't able to articulate my feelings was impacting other people. Um, and that kind of led me to taking a step back and understanding how to open up, why it's important to open up talking to other people um, who have been through similar experiences as I have and other therapists and a lot of people my, who work, who I know that work in the mental health space um, and just constantly working through it um, day by day and understanding that me asking for help, me talking about my, my struggles is not a sign of weakness. That was the biggest thing I had to overcome is recognizing that the things that I've been taught in the past weren't, weren't right. You know what I'm saying? And so I had to, it was a lot of unlearning. And, and, and relearning things and methods that can help me take a step forward to becoming the type of person that I want to be. And I'm still working through that. So, you, you know, it's a constant work in progress type thing, but it was just, um, you know, more so about just understanding that um, if I want to become the person that I want to become, it's going to take some, some, you know, some hard lessons and, and, and taking a step back and understanding what the, what are the steps I need to take to get there. I think especially that process of unlearning and relearning and, uh, you know, 
looking at sort of the things that you learn from your adolescence and, you know, grooming processes through your childhood and how you really want to be. I, th I think that was key with what you said. And um, also also being able to realize, uh, you know, how you also want to treat people as well, because I, I think one thing when I t when I look at a lot of, you know, speaking about being vulnerable, you know, Whitley, whether it's with friends, family or just regular people, being able to have that support system around you, being able to know those people that, you know, you can trust and go to and also being that same to other people and, and being able to have those open arms and, and the willingness to listen to other people's struggles. But um, for, for somebody who, you know, played overseas as a professional basketball player and, you know, experienced being in another culture and then, uh, you know, once your career ended, came back to America and sort of had to figure out what was next. This is something that, you know, I've I've heard a lot from a lot of different athletes is uh, you have tunnel vision throughout your childhood and, and you have this one goal of being an, uh, an athlete. And then once it's all over, you have to figure out what your true passion is and, and how you really want to impact the world in other ways. And so I'm curious, uh, through that process, after you retired, um, what did that process really look like of you, of you being able to uh, look at what your passions were outside of the game of basketball, while also not getting in your own mind or you're comparing yourself to others or having that whole sort of uh, fear of not being good enough outside of the game of basketball. So, so I think for me, I was, I was fortunate in, in the regard that my mom, you know, growing up was always big on education. So for my brother and I, who, you know, we didn't, I didn't really have any other athletes in our, in our, in my family. My, my mother more so put us in sports to get us away from other things we could have been involved in uh, growing up in the city. So it was like education was first and foremost in, and in the back of my mind, I always realized that I wasn't going to be an athlete forever. But as you mentioned before, like as an athlete to be the best athlete that you can possibly be, it takes that, that high intense focus on the, your sport. Um, and so from high school, all the way up to becoming a pro basketball was the priority. Um, and that was what I, I put a lot of my effort into. And so even going through that transition, in the back of my mind, knowing I wasn't going to be an athlete for my entire life, it was still going from my identity being an athlete and everybody recognizing me as that to trying to figure out how can I reshape my identity? How can I step into a new career? How can I, um, you know, figure out what my next act is going to be? And mm -hmm. that still was a struggle within itself and took a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of patience. I think in, in, in some regards, I'm still going through that transition. I've, I've, you know been retired from basketball for about five years now and it took like years to figure out well you know what are my skills what am I good at you know what do I like to do what am I you know what are my, what are my passions asking myself these really tough questions that a lot of athletes don't ask themselves um and then even more so trying a bunch of different things you know I, I started businesses I uh, would dive deep into topics to see if I was interested in it. I would start side projects. Like I did all these different things once I retired to figure out what my next path was going to be. And so it was that that trial and error process again of just exploring and and having the humility to to and, and willingness to really fail at a lot of different things in order to figure out what that next path is going to be. So it takes a lot of time and a, a lot of self awareness and, re and reflection. Um, and I think a lot of athletes really struggle with that trans transition because of that, um, but also because of the lack of support that you have through that. You know, you look at the piece of, of being an athlete, a lot of that is camaraderie. And, and, the, and, you know, speaking from a male perspective, the brotherhood, you know, you spend so much time with these people and you form this, this support system within that. But then when you leave the game, you don't have that. And so you're figuring a lot of this stuff out on your own. So it's numerous struggles that athletes go through. And I was, I wasn't exempt from that process, even though, like I said, I, I knew I wasn't going to be an athlete. Um, but it's about self-awareness and understanding that this is, is a process just like anything else in life. And, you know, that process, as you mentioned, is, is not always easy. And, you know, having that open mindedness to be able to go through those failures while also having, uh, you know, the trust in the process and that confidence in the process, because there's a lot of times if you fail once, you know, you, you sometimes you can just fall flat on your face and not have the uh, open mindedness or the confidence to get yourself back up and and try something else. And, you know, you had a great tweet that's that sort of, um, you know, speaks a very similar message of every opportunity ain't meant for you. So Sometimes the things that don't work in your favor end up being the biggest blessings. Never doubt the process. So from, you know, that tweet, uh, how did you really find ways to, you know, come to that consensus? 
Yeah, I think uh, a, lo a lot of that was just like trying to pursue paths that um, I thought were meant for me, but something happened, something got in the way to where it redirected me to where I was supposed to, to go. And so it's understanding that uh, whatever you believe in God or higher power may block that blessing um, in order to steer you in the right direction of where you're supposed to be. Um, and to me, that really goes back to the humility piece and understanding that um, you might you might have a plan or or a goal that you're trying to hit, but you know you might be steered in a completely wrong direction where you you know you could be devastated or upset or not understand why things are happening in the way they're happening. Mm -hmm. But years down the line, you look back in hindsight, and you recognize well that happened for a reason. So it's just understanding that like you know you'll 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 have this elaborate you can have this elaborate plan for your life but life doesn't always go the way you expect it so you kind of just got to ride it out and and understand that you know whatever you believe in is steering you in a place that you're supposed to be for the long term i think that's so key to to keep in mind especially when you are going through some of those tough days uh you know i i've had a few instances as, as anybody has of you know something doesn't go my way i, I don't get a job or you you know uh there's a little bit of a roadblock in my path because a lot of times with goals you know we, we have this goal and subconsciously we already have this date where we want to get this goal done if it doesn't if something steers us off the way, you know, it's sometimes, you know, pe people can look at it as, as a huge failure or as um, allowed to deter them, but still being able to steer clear and, and, and be able to go towards that is is super important. And you, you had another really good, I believe it was a LinkedIn post. It, it said, or no, it was a tweet. It's there's no growth without discomfort. There's no progress without struggle. There's no flowers without rain. Sometimes you got to go through the worst to get to the best. And the, and the one thing that, you know, that, that reminds me of is, I, I always hear you have to go through a breakdown in order to go through a breakthrough. Yeah. You, when, when you're feeling the most resistance is, is when you're about to break through, when you, when something good is about to happen. And so I think, you know, it reminds me of the quote that, you know, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. A lot of the greatest things in life happen through struggle. Um, and I, and I look back at my athletic career and it, I had a ton of struggles. I had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of situations and scenarios where I was like, why the hell is this happening to me? Or, you know, there's, there's no way I'll be able to reach this goal, you know, going through this or whatever, you know, whatever I was thinking in the moment. Um, but again, looking in hindsight, like those experiences um, not only were meant to happen, but they taught me so much about, uh, you know, being the person I am today, they're such a big part of who I am today. And I value those those obstacles that I went through because it, I wouldn't be me without, you know what I'm saying? So I think it's it's understanding that um, those struggles in life, they're, are, they're meant for a bigger purpose um, and, and just riding it out, man, uh, rolling with the punches, so to speak, and, and understanding that that's life is like a roller coaster. There's going to be ups and downs. I hope that you are enjoying my conversation with Malcolm, but I just want to take a second to talk to you about today's sponsor, which is Versus Game. And it's essentially an opportunity for you to make money from your knowledge with questions that are 1v1 and you get paid if you're right. As a player, you can play for free or you can play with real money by purchasing ticket bundles and going up against players that choose the opposite answer as you. I'm actually going to be coming up with some questions that you can interact with over the next few weeks. And this week's question is since last week I had on a former pro baseball player and this week I had on a former pro basketball player, I want to switch it up a little bit. So let me know what you think. Will my next guest be a sports broadcaster or an actor? Let me know by visiting my custom URL, jakeiggy.onversus.com. You can also visit www.versusgame.com on the mobile web to also see some other questions and fun games over on their website. We'll be talking about the result of this question in the next episode, as well as introducing a new question. So make sure to get excited for that. I'm also going to be replying to comments. So after you vote, let us know your reasoning and we'd love to hear it. Make sure to go over and check out Versus Game dot com now let's get back into my conversation with malcolm i i heard this cool quote from uh from big sean i think it was from a jay shetty interview and it sort of alluded to what you just said of wh why did this happened uh to me and big sean said no why did this happened for you yep 100 percent. yeah i love that 
And, you know, be, being able to, you know, to take those lessons and to be able to, you know, you know use those as fuel. I, I think you've done a great job with that, you know, with your two books, um, Lessons from the Game and the Impact Beyond the Game. I'm, I'm curious, uh, fr from writing those different books, it probably allowed you to reflect on a lot of different uh, key moments in your life and key uh, moments in, in your journey throughout your mental health uh, journey. And I'm, I'm curious, so, some of the biggest realizations you might have had um, through writing those books. I think for the first one, which honestly kind of happened by mistake. I wasn't, I didn't have a plan to become an author. Um, writing was therapeutic at the moment being overseas. And it was, it was a way that I could kind of get everything that was on my mind, you know, speaking about anxiety, get everything that was on my mind on the paper um, and out. And so it was really a, more so a method of journaling than it was like, okay, I'm trying to become a published author. But I think the biggest realization um with especially with that first book was uh understanding how much a sports can is applicable to life um everything from you know I, I i spoke before about camaraderie like the teamwork you know working with other people um from different backgrounds religions ethnicities that's a, that's a big part of sports or um working towards a common goal at being gore oriented or um you know having you know, going back to patience like having the patience and and uh, the, the, the discipline to put time into something every single day of your life. Um, all of these intangibles, these traits that I learned through sports are things that I apply to business, to my career every single day in life after the game. So, so much of, of, you know, becoming an athlete or being an athlete is recognizing how to use the game and, and not letting the game use you. You know, we hear that all the time, but what does that really mean? It's understanding how to maximize those opportunities um, as an athlete and leveraging that in ways that you can leverage them in, in life after sports. Um, and so that was probably the most um, impactful thing from, from writing that first book, but also looking at impact beyond the game, was, which was more focused on teaching athletes how to, how to, how to build their brands and, and create monetization opportunities uh, during their careers and even afterwards, um, how that carries over to that, you know, maximizing your platform, that notoriety, that relevance that you have as an athlete. How do you leverage that? How do you take your name, image, and likeness um, and create a brand, create business opportunities, create sustainability over the long term so that nothing that you did as an athlete goes in vain? So there's so many bits and pieces that I take from writing both of those books that um, I think we're not over, only crucial to me and, and Im impactful for me, but also for other athletes who are going through this journey, who will go through this journey in the future. I think that's so important, too, because there's a lot of times where and we spoke about it earlier, where so many athletes just tie their identity and, and tie who they are to that specific sport. And, you know, they're just so focused and entrenched in that. And, you know, now we're starting to see more more athletes, you know, be becoming more vocal on social media, wanting to build their brand out, outside of you know what they do. Dan, Dansby Swanson, uh, the, the new infielder for the Chicago Cubs, comes to mind a lot. And, and he's somebody who has, uh, you know, a positivity and mental health clothing brand out, outside of, you know, him, him playing baseball and you know also um you know be, being able to use your voice outside of just what you do and, th and that's one thing that you know i really try to do uh with this podcast is you know i i i have a job as a, as a sports reporter and a sports journalist but i, I in my mind I feel like everybody has a voice. So if I'm able to use my voice for good and use my voice to help others through not only, you know, people like yours experiences, but my own experiences, um, it's able to help a lot more people in, in other ways. And I, I feel like I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of, a lot of the things that you spoke about in those books were able to impact a lot of people, even if they weren't athletes. Yeah, absolutely. I think in, in this day and age, you know, you talked about everyone has a voice and everybody can create their own platform. You don't need permission to tell your story or to, convey your your experiences or your thoughts to the world i think that's it can be a blessing and a curse but largely you know how you leverage your platform as you said can impact other people's lives and i think taking that perspective understanding that the things that you've been through in your life your experiences can really help shape the way other people live their lives or or, or change the way they think and i think that's such a powerful um you know, just a, such a powerful thing and, and, and really just the, the the impact of social media and how we leverage it, it it's 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 crucial in this day and age and so I think we all have a responsibility to uh, kind of push that message forward push the narrative forward and, and leverage our platforms in ways that it can really make a difference in someone else's lives. 
I think you do a really good job at that. You know, I, I see your LinkedIn posts like a few times a week and always puts a smile on my face because you're you're real. And, and that's the one thing that I think is is huge about, you know, not not only, you know, athletes leveraging their brand, but just like humans in general using social media, not using it so much as a highlight reel, but using it as whether it's a journal, whether it's to to help others through to to motivate them through what you've done or um to, to really just use it as as a platform how you want to use it. Cause so many times we see people just compare themselves to other people wanting to, you know, take what somebody else did because they got more likes or they got more views and allowing that to fuel how they feel about themselves and not taking those numbers as much as, as um, how you value yourself, but using what you do and, and what you post to try and help other people or try and try and help yourself as well. Yeah. I, I think from time to time, you know, we all kind of get caught up in the vanity metrics. Uh, it's, it's natural human psychology, oh, yeah. but um, I always try to approach it from the standpoint of like, is this post helping somebody learn something or providing value to someone else's life? And not really trying to make it so much about me and what I'm trying, my end objective, but how can this piece of information or this quote or whatever I'm posting change someone else's perspective or help them in some type of way. So I think always having that approach um, is really important and can really make be the difference in those vanity metrics, to be honest with you. So if that's what you strive for at the end of the day, you have to take a standpoint of how can this help somebody else, not can how, how I can benefit from it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, I, I wanted to end this conversation on, on some of my favorite questions to ask some of the guests. And uh, I'll, I'll start off with this one. This is my all time favorite question. Anytime I ask it, it makes people go, whoa, let me think. Uh, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, there's a lot that I can tell my younger self, but I think the most important thing uh, would probably be to continue doing with your what you're doing um and always try to be in service and 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 to provide value first and foremost so always i mean i think i i try to do a great job of that throughout my life um but i think it it, it always pays to serve other people mm -hmm. you know and, and not not really putting yourself at the forefront but understanding how you can always be looking to provide value for other people is, is supremely underrated in my opinion. Um, and I think anybody who's trying to build a career, kindness, empathy, and serving other people will never steer you wrong. So that's probably what I would tell myself is to always be of service first and, first and foremost. And also what, what's, what's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice. <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, Probably, I mean, I always think about the quote, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. That's one of my favorite quotes. Um, but I think the best advice that I've, that I've ever received was probably be just going back to to being empathetic. You know, as, as kind of as I mentioned before, I think there's a lot of negativity in the world. There's a lot of uh, going back to like vanity and and superficialness and, and, and things of that nature. But I think that putting ourselves in other people's shoes um, and trying to be empathetic to other people's situations is, is, is somewhat becoming a lost art in, in the mix of all this. So I think if you're able to do that, no matter what you're doing in life, you will be successful. And so empathy, I think, is one of the most underrated uh, characteristics or skills that that's out there and it will become more coveted in the future so if you can if you can be empathetic um that can be extremely valuable in in life in general you know business whatever the case may be so it, it'd probably just be to put yourself in other people's shoes honestly i love that i uh i i think a lot about you know perspective is everything and, and there's a lot of times where our perspective can be clouded through our experiences, but I, I actually went on a, a two week road trip uh, with no social media and did all on the East coast. Uh, I think it was about two years ago. Um, and I grew up in a, in a small town in, in Southern New Hampshire uh, in new England. And so uh, 
I, I pretty much, you know, went to went to school with, you know, 98, 99 percent white people. And, and you know, it was it was really interesting for me to, you know, go to uh, West Virginia, Kentucky, um, you know, a Virginia, you know, all the uh, South Car or South or North Carolina, like all these different states and see, you know, all these different environments, see, you know, all these different perspectives. Uh, and, and it really opened up my eyes to, you know, how everybody else lives outside of, you know, where, where I grew up and, you know, it, it all who you are and, and, you know, who, how you are eventually groomed is all through your environment, all through, you know, who you have around you, but, you know, who you really become at the end of the day is, is you're in charge of that. And I think being able to have that perspective is huge. And I actually heard JJ Watt, he talked about it, uh, uh, two days ago when he was talking about him retiring, he said, you know, I, I think about a lot, you know, even though I don't have a Super Bowl ring and, you know, some people might look at that as the ultimate goal as an NFL player. He said, uh, you know, I, I look at, you know, how grateful I am to even be in this position, to even be in the right. position to play as a professional football player, to be around the people that I'm I'm around. And, you know, you know, a, a, a lot of people would, you know, dream of being in my exact position. I, I think being able to have that clarity and that humility um, as somebody who, who is as successful as he is and being able to have that perspective, even if you're, you know, myself or you or just anybody who's listening to this podcast, being able to have that perspective to look at, you know, what other people's lives are and putting your putting yourself in their shoes, I think is huge as well. Um, but, you know, looking towards um, the year of 2023, I, I know that you're you're working on a lot of stuff uh, with, with with Web3 and in your new newsletter, the hype report. But I'm curious, um, lo looking into the, the year of 2023, what is really your purpose for this next year? Um, the, I mean, the, I guess the purpose with the hype report is just to continue uh onboarding more people into specifically sports professionals into the web three uh, landscape, the web three space, but getting them to understand why this is so revolutionary um, and how this is going to impact sports in the next five to 10 years. So that is, that's kind of like the mission behind the platform and the way we do that is a, is a weekly newsletter. Um, and it's just continue building the readership and, and, uh educating people on uh on the space and so i'm i'm excited about kind of where the web3 space is is headed as it pertains to sports even though we've seen a lot of uh you know with the, the ftx collapse and all these different things that have happened in the space i think it's 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 natural and it's, it's a part of any form of innovation you're going to have um your 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 scammers and 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 all these different kind of uh negative sides to it but um i think there's a lot of upside when it comes to web three and sports and, and i'm a huge believer in kind of where the space is headed so i'm i mean my whole purpose is to really help drive the conversation forward i love it i i think especially with things as new as as web three pe people need to understand that there is going to be those those hiccups like the the ftx and you know i'm i'm 23 years old i have i have no clue what what the start of the internet looked like in the in the you know early 90s or you know early 2000s but you know i, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a lot of hiccups during that time as well and i think it's really important for for people to um, be patient and see how it evolves and, and see how they can fully take advantage of it. But I love what you what, what you're doing in that space and, and also in the mental health space. And you know, for anybody that wants to support you, whether it's on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, if they want to find out more about the hype report, um, how can they support you and, and help you continue to um, not only elevate your brand but ele elevate your other businesses. Yeah, so um, I'm I'm on every social media platform, probably most active on LinkedIn at uh, Malcolm Lemons. Um, and the hype report is uh, the hype report dot beat hive dot com, which I know is lengthy, but trying to nail down that that URL um, in, in this this upcoming year. Uh, but yeah, just would, would love any support, feedback, always down to to talk with people in the space. So i um, excited about 2023 and the opportunities that are that are ahead. So. Awesome. Really, really appreciate you taking the time, Malcolm, and can't wait to continue to support you throughout this journey. Absolutely, my man. I appreciate the opportunity as well. Absolutely. I hope that you did enjoy my conversation with Malcolm Lemons and got to get a little bit more insight on how he's been able to feel comfortable sharing his mental health struggles with others. Also, the impact that therapy has had on him. And lastly, how he's been able to find himself outside of the game of basketball. But I hope that you were able to take something from this and apply it to your own life. That's honestly my goal with each and every single episode. I, I really, truly want to help people 
through this podcast, through my words and you know, through other people's experiences as well. And if you did enjoy this episode and if you want to get notified for bi-weekly episodes that come in the future, make sure to subscribe to Iggy Sports Talk over on whatever audio platform that you're listening to right now or over on YouTube for the video versions. I also post clips and updates regarding the podcast on Instagram, so you can follow it over there. It's at Iggy Sports Talk. As always, I greatly appreciate everybody tuning into this episode. I hope that you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you and talk to you next time. Peace.